Hello and good afternoon uh, and happy birthday to the Affordable Care Act. Uh, we are here, <laughs> yes, happy birthday. Uh, we are here to celebrate the 12th anniversary of the Affordable Care Act, and it is my absolute pleasure to introduce a key drafter, implementer, defender, and now builder um, of the Affordable Care Act, Secretary Javier Becerra. Beth, thank you very much, and to each and every one of you, it's, uh, it's going to be even better than it is today when we get to actually gather and fill this auditorium without having to worry about distancing so much. So it's great to see so many people who had a real hand in helping not only lay the foundation and build the Affordable Care Act, but now to see it thrive. And so thank you to each and every one of you here at the Department of Health and Human Services, certainly to the folks at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, big shout out to each and every one of you, and I have the pleasure of introducing the administrator of CMS, Chiquita brooks Lashure, in just a moment. I, I wanted to just say a few things because uh, I could actually spend all my time giving shout outs to the people I see in this audience uh, for everything that you've done over the course of time and certainly in this past year that President Biden laid down the challenge for us to do it even better. And so uh, while I'd like to do that, I think you probably will agree with me, perhaps the better thing to do is to point out what we've accomplished together. Uh, we've reduced the number of uninsured Americans in this country by 20 million. We have extended insurance coverage through the marketplaces under the Affordable Care Act and through Medicaid and its expansion in close to 40 states so that today there are 31 million Americans who can count on access to a good doctor, quality hospital services as a result of the Affordable Care Act. Today there are 133 million Americans who don't have to worry again about an insurance company saying, oh yeah, we'd cover you, except you have asthma, and we don't accept people for coverage who have pre-existing medical conditions. It also means that a woman who might be of childbearing age can no longer be told that she's got a pre-existing medical condition because she is childbearing. We've done a lot of things. We've protected all those young Americans who are out there working but didn't have health insurance, but were under the age of 26, and therefore were eligible to stay on their parents' plan. That was a good one. I have three daughters, one still under the age of 26. We have provided coverage to 4 million Latinos and 3 million black Americans since 2010. We have continued to see progress in making Medicare for seniors work better because of the Affordable Care Act's provisions that reduced the cost for prescription drugs for seniors, which also made preventative health care services at no charge, no copay available to seniors. And of course, we know what it's meant for women to have access to preventative health care services, including birth control, including counseling, including well woman visits. I say that not just because it's good, but because my wife as an obstetrician gynecologist knows how important that is. And now, of course, we're building on the ACA. We're making sure that we take the 14 and a half million Americans who took that leap of faith with us and signed up for affordable care and we want to make it even better. But let's not forget what it took to get to 14 and a half million Americans who now have insurance. They got that card the way so many other Americans have that lets them go to any doctor, any hospital within their plan to get the care that they need. That's important because there were too many Americans who'd never had that opportunity. We're going to build on that. We're going to do what we did to make us succeed with 14 and a half million Americans. We're going to continue to have the navigators that make it possible for people to know what plan is best for them. We're going to make sure we go to you and not wait for you to come to us to learn what kind of coverage you can get. And if Congress works with us, we'll be able to make available to Americans, as we did for four out of every five eligible participants in the marketplace, a health insurance plan that required them to pay a premium every month of no more than $10. And as I keep telling folks, and I just went to go see that Batman movie with my daughter, it cost me a heck of a lot more than 10 bucks to see one movie for one night, let alone have health insurance coverage for myself, for my family, 
for $10 or less for the entire month. Not a bad deal. Not a bad deal. But then again, we, we've heard the stories, right? In 2010, I heard them all the time when I was in Congress. It was, this is going to create death panels. The Affordable Care Act will lead to others deciding for you if your mom or your granddad is going to live. Uh, we're going to prevent people from being able to go to their own doctor, their private physician. And of course, we've heard those stories over and over again. What you perhaps haven't heard so much is some of the stories like the one from Joe, a house painter in Pittsburgh, who said, I had no health insurance at all due to the skyrocketing costs of annual premiums. Then in 2010, I suffered an aortic aneurysm and netted a $69,000 hospital bill after an 11-day stay. Thanks to the Affordable Care Act, I am able to purchase affordable coverage without being discriminated against due to my pre-existing condition. Uh, that's the kind of thing you want to hear because that's what makes it possible for us to move forward. Or perhaps you heard the story uh, articulated by someone like uh, Melanie Orman who said, I'm alive today because of an amazing medical team and the Affordable Care Act. Melanie suffered a brain aneurysm 10 years ago. Uh, thanks to the Affordable Care Act, her insurance covered the brain surgeries she needed to survive. It would have cost her $1.2 million had she not had the insurance. We went from people claiming that we were instituting death panels to people claiming that the Affordable Care Act saved their lives. Amen. Amen to that. And we've heard this before, right? It was, you're going to socialize medicine. You're going to end the days where we could choose the doctors we wanted. Uh, but those aren't the stories that we really care about. The stories we care about are the truthful stories. And so I will simply say to you, just as in... 19, in the 1960s, when President Johnson was about to enact Medicare, or just as in the 1930s, when President Roosevelt was enacting Social Security, people were naysayers. People were deniers. But we're America, and we make progress. We move forward. And so to each and every one of you Americans who actually had a hand in drafting, crafting, implementing, the Affordable Care Act, thank you so very much. I count myself among you. We've been in the same foxhole, and it feels good when we have each other's backs. And I think the American people, at least 14 and a half million of them who are now insured, at least 133 million of them who no longer have to worry about a pre-existing condition, at least millions of those young Americans who stayed on their health insurance coverage that their parents had, all of them will say, we've had their back. Let's continue to do that. We've got work to do. There are more Americans w waiting to hear us say, we've got your back. I'm thrilled that we've gone this far. Let me now introduce to you the person who is in charge of making sure we actually make the ACA click, that we actually get those Americans the coverage they need, that we don't wait for them to come to us, we go to them. Chiquita brooks Lashure is someone who is no stranger to the ACA, no stranger to health care, no stranger to the CMS programs that we have. Uh, she has worked diligently over time, whether in Congress, whether here in HHS, or whether now as the administrator making sure that we give Americans what they deserve, where we treat health care as a right, not a privilege. And so it is my pleasure to introduce the boss at CMS, Administrator Chiquita brooks Lisher. Thank you, Secretary Becerra. It is such a joy to be with you here, as well as my HHS colleagues, and to all of you virtually who have joined us. We would not be here without you today, and it is so exciting to mark the 12th anniversary of the Affordable Care Act being signed into law. Today, the Affordable Care Act is at the strongest point in its history, thanks to 12 years of diligent implementation efforts, defense in the courts and in Congress, Congress, and implementation of the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. As a result, health care costs are historically low. A record high of 14.5 million people signed up for coverage through the health insurance marketplaces during the recent open enrollment period. 
two new states have expanded Medicaid over the last year, and the healthcare system is providing access to better quality, more affordable care to millions of people across this country. Thanks to the ACA's expansion of the Medicaid program, over 18.7 million adults are now covered across 39 states and the District of Columbia. At CMS, we are dedicated to delivering better health care and health coverage for all people. Yesterday, CMS staff celebrated these milestones alongside longtime supporters, early implementers of the ACA from the Biden-Harris administration, as well as uh, former CMS administrators. Together, we entered the ACA along with the Social Security Act amendments of 1965 into the CMS Museum to commemorate the incredible impact of the ACA on our country. As you know, I helped draft the ACA as a committee staffer on the Hill and helped implement the law at HHS and at CMS during the Obama administration. Yesterday, it was one of my proudest moments as CMS administrator to dedicate a redlined copy of the ACA to CMS and to thank CMS staff for the work that they have done and will do for the American people. We have staff who have been here for the whole 12 years working to make sure that the promise of the Affordable Care Act became a reality. The ACA created our third M in the M in CMS, the marketplaces, alongside Medicare and Medicaid and CHIP. It launched the CMS Innovation Center. It helped reduce drug prices for people with Medicare, completing our nation's commitment to better health and giving all people their right to health care throughout their lives. The ACA is here to stay and it took and took its landmark place next to Medicare and Medicaid as our hallmark law. We wrote it, we passed it, implemented and defended it. And now it's time to continue to build on that progress. Today, we released the state of the ACA report. In short, the Affordable Care Act fundamentally changed the American healthcare system. And with the passage and implementation of the American Rescue Plan, the Biden-Harris administration is building on the ACA by lowering costs and expanding coverage. The 2022 open enrollment period resulted in a record-breaking high of 14.5 million consumers signed up for the Affordable Care Act marketplace coverage, representing a 2.5 million or 21% increase from the previous year's open enrollment period. During the first full year of the Biden-Harris administration, nearly six million new consumers signed up for coverage through the health insurance marketplaces nationwide during the 2021 special enrollment period and the 2022 open enrollment period. These gains add to the nearly 31 million people enrolled in Medicaid or Marketplace and Affordable Care Act related coverage at the beginning of 2021. Thanks to the Affordable Care Act and the American Rescue Plan, this is the highest number of covered individuals. Without the American Rescue Plan, the average monthly premium after tax credits would have been $59 per month higher or 53% higher. Nationwide, 2. Point million more consumers are receiving tax credit savings for 2022 compared to 2021. And those st stats are numbers, but as you'll hear later, these these things change people's lives. That premium difference that I just described, I heard from a navigator in Delaware how that meant the difference between someone being able to afford their medication for diabetes. These things change what people are able to do and how they are able to live their best lives. The American Rescue Plan subsidies enabled record enrollment figures and eased financial burdens on Americans during the worst public health crisis in a generation.
We also made a concerted effort to make affordable care more accessible to historically underinsured and underinsured populations by conducting targeted outreach to historically underserved communities. This included advertising for the first time in Chinese, Mandarin and Cantonese, Korean, Vietnamese, Tagalog, and Hindi and specific campaigns to the black and Latino communities. As a result of these efforts, in healthcare.gov states, enrollment among Hispanic people increased by 26% and by black people, in, in black, for, for black people increased by 35%. President Biden is committed to extending financial assistance that reduces health care premiums for millions of Americans who enroll in marketplace coverage and to closing the Medicaid gap, which would lead to 4 million uninsured people having access to coverage. I really want to thank all of the partners watching who worked so hard with all of us to pass implement and defend the ACA. We would not be here without you. Join us now as we continue to build on that progress. Thanks to the ACA, people can count on better health. They can access free preventive services like vaccinations and health screenings. In fact, the ACA requires all insurers, including private insurers, to cover preventive services at no cost. We thank you and look forward to continuing to partner with you. The highlight of seeing the Affordable Care Act over the years really has been about seeing the faces hearing the stories of the individuals and families that have been able to gain access to coverage. The ACA has changed the landscape for how people across this country can access health care. In fact, the ACA established a network of navigator organizations in support of the work of certified application counselors. Enrollment assisters have become an invaluable resource for our communities as they help consumers apply and understand their health coverage options in linguistically and culturally appropriate ways. Navigators on the ground help individuals um, utilize and understand how to utilize their health coverage. So as a navigator, we can speak on how we have seen the Affordable Care Act be life altering. You know, we stay in contact with our consumers and a lot of times they'll call us back and say, because of me being able to enroll in the Marcus Place plan, I was able to afford coverage to receive treatment for my cancer. No one should be in the position of trying to decide whether they need to, you know, fill a refrigerator or fill a prescription. During COVID-19, there were a lot of job changes, life changes for people, and the Affordable Care Act was there and provided a safety net and flexibility for people in a way that we wouldn't have had 12 or 15 years ago. I can't imagine going through this public health emergency and having people lose their on-the-job benefits and not have uh, the new options under the Affordable Care Act. Our communities uh, continue to have options for their health care. We see the ripple effects being able to lead happier, healthier lives. The Affordable Care Act has brought folks a lot of dignity and access to care. It taught us that progress is possible, that we can take these big issues, these seemingly unsurmountable problems, and we can actually make a difference. Happy anniversary to the Affordable Care Act. Thank you for giving me the privilege to help our communities stay healthy. My name is Rachel, I'm 27 years old and I live in Atlanta, Georgia. And I signed up because I needed insurance that I could afford. I've always been able to afford health insurance, they just wouldn't cover me because I'm, you know, diagnosed diabetic. My name is Kelly and thanks to the Affordable Care Act, this is the first time that I've ever had insurance as a self-employed single woman. And it feels really good. 
I signed up for health insurance. That began on January 1st. My appendix burst in April. I ended up being in the hospital for over two weeks. If I hadn't gotten health insurance on the marketplace, I would have been stuck with a $120,000 bill. The Affordable Care Act, for me, it means that I can do both, pay my rent and go to the doctor when need be. I received my health insurance card. I felt like a kid who just received a driver's license. You know, I was dancing around the house like, yeah. I use my health insurance on the regular. I do get a physical every year, and I also just get checked up, you know, whether it's National HIV Testing Day. I, I'm so grateful that I have uh, health insurance because I can take care of myself the way I need to be taken care of. I honestly think the Affordable Care Act did save my life. I was living life as a regular college student, and then all of a sudden I was a cancer patient. My name is Chinello. I'm 24 years old, and I was diagnosed with cancer at the age of 22. I'm cancer free today and I was only able to get the treatments because I was able to purchase health insurance. I was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2003. Seven insurance companies turned me down and rejected me because I had a pre-existing condition. As I was trying to process the fact that my two-year-old has cancer, I was also trying to figure out how, how, how am I gonna take care of her? For AV, treatment is a difference between life and death, and there is just as a parent, there's um, nothing, nothing more important than that to make sure that your child can get the treatment that they need. Having health insurance is so important. I think of it as freedom, like freedom to decide what you want to do with your life. I want to be a farmer. Maybe it's not the most financially beneficial decision, but it's something that I love doing. And having health insurance is part of that so that I'm not staying in a position or a job or something just to keep the benefits. Suddenly I can make my own decisions and really branch out. If I didn't have insurance, if I happened to get sick, it would ruin my credit and it would ruin my potential business expansion. Having health insurance is absolutely enabling me to chase my dream. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us here today. We're so glad to be able to celebrate the 12th birthday of the Affordable Care Act with all of you. Um, we had, we're pleased yesterday to have conversations with some of the key architects of the Affordable Care Act, including our CMS administrator. Um, and in, in conversation, I, I, was, I was talking with Jean Lambrew, who many of you know was one of the key implementers and architects of the ACA. And she said, these jobs at HHS are so unique because in a normal job or other job, sometimes you spend more minutes, more hours doing stuff, and it's not necessarily it's gonna make a dent. But here at HHS, if we spend more minutes, we spend more hours, it means that someone may be additionally served by our programs, someone is protected by the laws we write and serve, and so that to me is a very moving and changing charge. So thank you to you all for all the work that you're doing, and thank you so much for your commitment to the work. Um, and that includes our panelists here today, and we're so lucky to be joined by a really wonderful panelist um, group who are leaders here in the department in implementing the ACA, but also those who, some of them have a track record with the Affordable Care Act, which makes this, I think, a pretty cool conversation. Um, I have my titles here, so bear with me for a moment. Um, so we're gonna start with Deputy Administrator and Director of the Center for Medicare, Dr. Mina Sheshmani. Mina uh, leads our Center for Medicare, um, but she was also here back in 2010 and helped lead the Office of Health Reform implementing the Affordable Care Act. Acting Administrator, Administration for Community of Living and Assistant Secretary, Allison Barkoff. Allison worked on the front lines of both passing and defending the Affordable Care Act. She worked alongside a coalition of people with disabilities, older adults, health care advocates to illustrate to Congress the need and role of the ACA in protecting people with pre-existing conditions, including protecting access to care and making it available for older adults and people with disabilities. Deputy Administrator and Director for Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, Dr. Liz Fowler. Many of you know Liz, worked at the Senate Finance Committee for Chairman Bacchus, where she played a critical role in developing the, the Affordable Care Act law itself, and was also critical in helping to implement it. We're so lucky that she's back here with us at the department. Sorry. 
Deputy Administrator of HRSA, Diana Espinosa. Diana's leadership and role at HRSA led on the workforce provisions that were included in the Affordable Care Act, where she helped implement critical congressional staff workforce provision across the department, including the reauthorization of many of those programs. And Director of the Center for Medicaid and CHIP Services and Deputy Administrator Dan Sai. Dan helped lead critical health reform at the Massachusetts um, Medicaid agency where he led innovative approaches through their 1115 waiver. And last, we're joined by um, Deputy, Ass Deputy Assistant Secretary Tom Cordaire, who has played a critical role in shaping our nation's work in substance abuse and disorder crisis, and, and which is critical at the department now. Thank you so much for being here, panelists. We'll go ahead and get started with the questions. I'm sorry, I'm a tad bit nervous. Um, so, let's get started. Deputy, Adminer, De Deputy, hello. Deputy <laughs> Administrator Shashmani, how did the ACA change coverage for prescription drugs? Well, thanks, Melanie, and thanks for being here today. It's wonderful to be here and to be celebrating the ACA. So as you may know, the Affordable Care Act closed the donut hole, which was the gap in coverage in prescription drugs in Medicare. And by doing so, more than 15 million seniors saved more than $60 billion. So just to think about how that one provision so dramatically impacted people's access to care. But I think as you all also know, high cost prescription drugs continues to be an issue for our nation and for people with Medicare. People over 65 with end stage renal disease, with disability who really rely on prescription drugs to keep them healthy. And we at CMS are committed to advancing equity driving high quality person-centered care. But if the medications that you need to take to stay healthy are unaffordable or too expensive, that prevents us from being able to keep people healthy. And so as a physician, I have seen this when I had a patient who had an ear infection that wouldn't go away. I'm an ear, nose, and throat doctor. Literally, Medicare person with Medicare on our smartphones on GoodRx trying to find a prescription that she could afford. Um, and I've seen it also as an economist working on how do we build these care models that are going to keep people healthy, keep them out of the hospital, but then the high cost of the medications negate all of the work that you're doing. And so being able to have Medicare negotiate drugs would enable affordable drug prices and foster the scientific innovation for the cures that we need. So that is some of the work that we can build on starting from that foundation in the ACA with closing the donut hole. I think that's such important work and you know, given your previous role here at the department and your new role, does, how does that feel to you that you get to come back and, and really take the helm? Oh, I mean, it's just incredible. Like, I, there are both micro and macro. There are so many ways, it comes back to what you said, Melanie, so many ways how the work that we do impact the lives of individual people and impact the lives of communities. You know, and so now working, you know, with Dr. Fowler and the Innovation Center, we're really working on holistic care models to bring people with Medicare under these models where they're cared for as people, not as a diagnostic code coming in for an episode in a clinic visit, but as people who have lives, who have families, who have food issues, who may have safety concerns. And you know, when I was working leading care transformation in a major health system, we had invested in community health workers. We had invested in care managers because of these models that I had worked on when I was here at the department before. So then lo and behold, the pandemic hits, and what are we able to do? We mobilized our mobile primary care van, our community health workers, and we got out there in inner city Baltimore, low income black senior housing with community health workers from those neighborhoods to get people vaccinated. And we had a more than two thirds acceptance rate for vaccines, which at that time at the start of the pandemic and the start of the vaccines was so remarkable because it's all about bringing care to where people are. And that's the work that we do here every day. And it's just a blessing to be part of it. 
You can tell you're very passionate, and we're very <laughs> lucky to have you. Um, Acting Assistant Secretary Barkoff, good to see you. Um, I think many of you know Allison is a, a champion and real warrior when it comes to disability rights and the laws and the shaping of those laws for this country. And so it's really a privilege to be here with you, Allison. Can you talk a little bit about the ACA and its role in expanding coordinated care and home and community-based services and, and sort of what that means for beneficiaries and what that means for our communities? Again, um, thanks for everyone being here, and it's really a privilege to be here to talk about these issues. It was so important in the Affordable Care Act. I think many people know things like protections for pre-existing conditions and expansion of Medicaid, but what a lot of people don't know is the Affordable Care Act was actually the biggest expansion of the home and community-based services that help people live and participate in their communities at that time since the beginning of the program in the 1980s. The Affordable Care Act had community first choice which has helped people get home care services to allow them to participate in their communities and live with their families and um, instead of being forced into nursing homes. We had a program that was reauthorized and funded called Money Follows the Person that has helped now more than 100,000 people with disabilities and older adults move from nursing homes to be part of their families and part of their communities. An issue that we are still working on is really balancing and rebalancing our long-term care systems. Um, systems that have heavily focused historically on institutional care to focus on the community services that people want that we know lead to better outcomes and are less expensive. And so we had at that time with the Affordable Care Act the balancing incentive program that really helped with that rebalancing. Um, in terms of civil rights, I mean, the Affordable Care Act at its core in these provisions is about vindicating the right of people to live and participate in their communities. And 1557, which is the civil rights provisions in the Affordable Care Act, sweep in the disability laws that really make that real. And then finally, Melanie, you mentioned coordination of care and really building that infrastructure. And so part of the Affordable Care Care Act help with looking at the whole person and coordinating between health care services and human services and getting the infrastructure in place to help people understand what are your options around long-term care. No Wrong Door really is not only the name of the program, but the philosophy. We want people to be able to, no matter how they get information, be able to make informed choices and really do what's best for them. And it's been incredible to be back in the administration that has such a commitment to making sure that people have that right to be part of their community, to be with their friends and family, and we are really building off the incredible work in the ACA. Thanks, Allison. Dr. Fowler, um, I feel I feel like of our panelists, there's a lot of celebrities up here. I will just say, like, I'm fangirling a bit over being on the same panel as Dr. Liz Fowler. Um, so, Liz, really great to see you as the Innovation Center um, CMMI head. What's changed since the law went into effect? We have an Innovation Center. How are we thinking to lift differently about the delivery of care, payment? Like, what are you thinking about and what are you focused on? Sure. Thanks, Melanie. I'm really happy to be here. And by the way, you introduced all of us and no one introduced you. You are also um, in the fandom category, um, having spent time on Capitol Hill and working with the California Attorney General's Office to defend the law um, before the Supreme Court. So thank you for everything you've contributed as well. Um, in terms of value-based care and our movement to value-based care, we've realized that it's more of a marathon and not a sprint. We've made significant progress, but we've also recognize that we have quite a bit of a ways to go. Um, in the center, um, the Innovation Center, we've had four models that have been certified to be expanded in um, duration and scope. Um, but I think that 
that number um, belies the real impact that these models have had. And, and Dr. Seshmani talked about those, uh, the impact that these models have on actual care delivery and the ability to develop um, and deliver better care to patients in the community. And so um, we feel like we've made progress, but we've got a ways to go. Um, in terms of what comes next, we're trying to shift to thinking more about the patient um, as the focal point for care delivery models. In the past, we've thought about um, moving providers into alternative payment models, and I think that's still important, but really we've got to focus on what why are we doing this? It's to improve care for patients. And so we're really trying to reorient our models to thinking about um, care improvements and value-based care from a patient perspective. Um, and I think the other point is um, that we're really thinking about health equity, which has become a real central um, driving force. Um, and it's something that's very important to our administrator, Chiquita brooks Lashur. She's encouraged all of us to think about um, how our work impacts um, underserved populations. And so we are building in elements of health equity into everything we do, from you know, development of models to thinking about how we evaluate evaluate the models, the data that we're collecting, and really trying to make sure that we're bringing on board some of those um, providers that serve for underserved populations. And the last thing I'll say is, um, you know, we saw during COVID, of course, the vast health disparities, and I think that's part of what has motivated this real focus on equity. COVID-19 also showed how vulnerable and fragile our healthcare system is. But what we have seen is that providers that focused on value and had made that transition to value-based care instead of being totally reliant on fee-for-service payments really did better. And so I think we're also thinking that the pandemic, if there is there's not very many bright spots, but I think one bright spot is that it does demonstrate that we can build more, um, I guess, how would I say, resiliency into our healthcare system by focusing more on value. And so that's why I'm really pleased to be back in the department, working with Dr. Seshmani, working with the administrator, and of course our other deputy um, administrator in Medicaid, and all of folks on the panel to think about how we can improve care. I remember when, you know, I, I was like a, a wee special assistant um, back when the ACA first came to this building, and I remember the conversations over adding Medicaid into the CMMI acronym, right? It couldn't just be CMI. It had to have the Medicaid, and people were really fighting hard. I mean, not that it was a fight, but just making sure it was inclusive of the Medicaid population, which I think is so cool. Um, it, uh, Deputy Administrator Espinosa, I, I think you can't think of the Affordable Care Act and not think about our federally qualified health centers and a lot of the programs within the HRSA walls. HRSA is such a big agency. Can you talk a bit about what the coverage expansions have meant for your population served in your neck of the woods? Sure, thank you, Melanie. Um, and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the mission of HRSA is to serve um, the people that have the, the most challenges accessing health care. So you can just imagine that the Affordable Care Act was just in instrumental, not only in increasing access, but helping us increase the quality of care that they receive. Um, and across her, so there's so many examples, but I'll just highlight um, a couple. Um, so the Affordable Care Act um, gave us the authority to issue um, women's preventive services guidelines. And these guidelines include the preventive services that health insurers are required to provide with no cost sharing. So mammography, cervical cancer screening, um, and, and, the, and so many more. Um, um, the, as you mentioned, the federally qualified health centers, our health center program um, saw uh, an increase in um, its patients that had health insurance coverage, um, almost doubling of uh, Medicaid coverage. This allowed them to increase the number of sites um, and increase the number of patients served to uh, 29 million patients. Um, and they were also able to increase the primary and preventive care services um, that are provided. So oral health, behavioral health, Health, pharmacy services, and others, and and that strengthening of that um, important network was just so valuable during the pandemic, um, because they became a critical access point for providing vaccination um, and other services to these populations. And and finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention um, the workforce aspects, because while we focus on um, the insurance, the Affordable Care Act also provided HHS um, significant new uh, authorities in uh, workforce programs 
times because a key part of getting access to health care is building that workforce. So, for example, we, for the first time, had really expanded um, authority to train uh, mental health and uh, providers. And we've uh, trained um, probably, you know, at least 20,000 just under that one program that the Affordable Care Act provided. Um, so, as I said, I could probably go on, um, but I'll leave it at that given um, there are others. Thanks. Thank you so much, and thank you for your leadership. Deputy Administrator Sai. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about the success of the ACA being the coverage numbers, right, and Medicaid and the private insurance market through the marketplaces. What does that coverage mean for our healthcare system? What does that coverage mean for working families and people across the country? Thanks, Melanie. So those of you that know me know I love Medicaid. I think Medicaid is the coolest thing, and because um, Ellen Mont's uh, director for Society is not here, I'd say Marketplace is pretty cool too. And Mina, it Medicare is. It's so is awesome. Cool the Marketplace. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> but it's hard to overstate the um, fundamental paradigm shift that came with the Affordable Care Act of low and very low income individuals, families, parents. Um, being able to have access to care through Medicaid expansion and um, through the marketplace um, and other pieces, not having pre-existing condi uh, conditions be a condition of rejection of coverage um, and the subsidies for affordability, not having coverage tied to um, necessarily employer coverage as well. And those things are paradigm shifting in coverage. And so, you know, Medicaid expansion, we have over 15 million, actually over 18 million individuals on Medicaid expansion um, in 30 nine states in the District of Columbia, record enrollment on the marketplace and Medicaid. And I remember prior to the ACA working um, on uh, in a call center helping folks enroll in coverage. There was a mother that called in um, in our discussions, kid with asthma could not get coverage for that child. And as a parent, it's, it's hard to imagine that sort of situation. The Affordable Care Act has fundamentally addressed um, that piece. Can you talk a little bit more about what's next? In our, so, you know, I think I've heard the administrator say there's still 28 million uninsured individuals nationwide, which, you know, we've done a lot of work and it's great, but that's still a lot of people. And so what more can, you know, what, what are you thinking about? What is CMS thinking about? How can we continue to work to give people health care? So as exciting as it is to sit here and, and um, recall all the achievements of the Affordable Care Act, it, it's quite motivating as well to think about what comes next. So coverage and coverage expansion, the administrator mentioned earlier, the coverage gap. So over 4 million individuals in 12 states do not have access to Medicaid expansion. Very low income individuals and parents do not have access to, to Medicaid coverage. Making the subsidies on the marketplace permanent, which is also part of uh, Build Back better as is coverage expansion. And then on the Medicaid side, coverage is one important first step. Access and access, timely access to services and equitable health outcomes is um, the area we are trying to focus as well. So um, it's exciting, it's motivating, we want to finish out the coverage piece and we want to think about how to make sure we have equitable high quality access to care for uh, individuals regardless of where uh, they live. Yeah, I think one of the really cool things CMS has done, right, through the Office of Communications is really taken coverage to people, right? We're not waiting for people to come to our website. We're, we're going where our communities are, churches, barbershops, and I think it's been really, really fantastic work in reaching out to some of our communities that are in need. Um, Acting Assistant uh, Secretary, Cory Dare. See, I know all these people's names. I just don't <laughs> say their full titles all of the time. So please, please don't take this away. Like, she doesn't know those people. I do. Um, you know, <laughs> there are about 50 million people with mental health conditions. The Affordable Care Act really took a significant shape with respect to how we think about mental health care, mental and behavioral health, access to coverage. Can you talk a little bit more about that work and how that's helped both sh shape how we view mental and behavioral health and also so helped our communities? Sure, Melanie, and good to see you in person. I've been on so many Zoom meetings with you, and it's great to be here in the, in the Great Hall. In addition to the 53 million people with uh, a mental illness uh, in this country, we also have 40 million or so people with a substance use disorder. Uh, and as a person in long-term recovery myself, uh, which means I haven't used alcohol or drugs since May 15th of 2003, um, that's really important to me. I'm passionate about helping those people find what I've found. And the Affordable Care Act, the 
ACA has been a game changer. It's been the largest expansion in history uh, of services uh, for people with mental illness and substance use disorder. Um, and it took us from a behavioral health system um, that was really fragmented uh, and really brought us together so that we could start to integrate, uh, as some of the folks on the panel have already mentioned, uh, primary care with behavioral health care. Um, in addition uh, to increased access, it, it also helped um, culturally normalize seeking treatment. Um, and when, when this is really hard for people with mental illness and substance use disorders to reach out and say that they have a problem and to seek treatment for it, the ACA helped people do that because they didn't have to worry anymore whether or not they had uh, coverage. Uh, it also uh, helped us establish a, an office at SAMHSA, an office for behavioral health equity. The ACA created the Office of Behavioral Health Equity long before uh, this became a priority uh, in this country. And that's helped us reduce disparities in programming, uh, our programming specifically. Uh, it helped us create uh, disparity impact statements for our grants, uh, which has been incredibly important. Um, and then lastly, I'll just mention uh, that it extended parity protections, which uh, we can't leave here today without talking about parity because there's still so much work to be done. But extending those parity protections has been critically important for people uh, with mental illness and substance use disorder. And I'm so proud of uh, Secretary Becerra, the department, uh, working with the Department of Labor and Secretary Walsh, uh, and the work that's to come in that area. I think that's also a good place to put in a plug for our colleagues. Um, Dr. Mons couldn't be here today, but our colleagues at Sasayo that also work very closely with SAMHSA on, we call it the MAPIA Act, Absolutely right? And so MAPIA. how do we continue to build that coverage and make sure people get what they're afforded by the law? Um, so thanks so much, Tom. Thank you. We're, we're almost out of time, so I'm going to do a couple of round robin mm -hmm. questions if folks can be a little bit quicker with their responses. Um, so one, we have a lot of different folks on here who wear different hats here at the department and have worn different hats during the tenure of the Affordable Care Act. And since it's the ACA's birthday, let's refocus there. What is the, the, the thing you're most proud of, of that you've worked proud of, of? Proud of that you've worked on in the Affordable Care Act, one. And then what is the most challenging thing that you've had to overcome as part of the ACA implementation? Um, let's go ahead and start backwards with Tom. So most proud of, so for me, I feel a little bit like an imposter up here because I didn't technically work on the AC. I'm working on the implementation of it, but uh, not the creation of it. Uh, but my uh, former colleague, Pam Hyde, who was the administrator at SAMHSA, um, really fought like crazy to get um, to get uh, substance use disorder and mental illness as part of one of the ten essential benefits, and that's been that's been an incredibly important part of this. As when we talk about challenges, I'd probably go back to MAPIA enforcement, uh, like you talked about. Uh, that's really you know when people have a mental illness or a substance use disorder, uh, oftentimes they don't feel like they can that they deserve coverage, that they don't feel like, and so when they get denied, they don't report it. And so we've we have a lot of work to do to go out. Uh, and enforce that law and make sure that plans, you know, by doing uh, assessments of the claims and looking at that kind of stuff to make sure that people aren't being discriminated against. Too many people are dying because they have been denied access to the care that they deserve and that the Affordable Care Act uh, afforded them. Dan? I think I'd say two things, proudest and challenged together. One, on behalf of the CMCS, Society, CMS teams, we were reflecting as a team, many staff have been here from the very beginning and through some of the most challenging days into now. Um, the team loves the Affordable Care Act and the implementation and you hear the war stories and what folks went through to make it happen. It is pretty incredible and those are some of the things that, you know, you don't read about all the time, um, and that's something that is uh, really powerful. And second, you know, coming from the state standpoint, implementing, working on the ground, um, the details of implementation, operationally, policy-wise, providers, delivery system, are equally critical and really challenging. And there's a lot of work we have to uh, continue to support that on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, one program that the Affordable Care Act created was um, a teaching health center program, which allows us to train uh, physicians in community-based settings and just be having the opportunity to kind of change the model and really let communities grow their own. And I should note that that has a provision that actually has funding um, for creating new, new teaching health centers, which was only funded um, in the American Rescue Plan, so for the first time. Um, so that was pretty, um, pretty exciting, too, to see that kind of come to fruition. 
Well, in terms of challenges, I would say uh, that this law has survived so many attempts to undermine and, um, and overturn the law, uh, and it's stronger for it. So after three Supreme Court cases and a lot of opposition by people who really don't believe that health care is a right, um, the law has survived, and, it, and we are all much stronger for it as a country and I think as the coverage that, that the law intended. Um, in terms of proudest moments, I mean, every time I see these videos, I hear the administrator's stories, the secretary's stories about people whose lives have been changed. Um, credit has been saved. Their lives have been saved. Their children are still alive today because of the coverage that they received that wouldn't have happened because of the ACA. Those are my proudest moments. I'd say some of the proudest moments for me are, are really similar. I think in the fight to defend the ACA, we actually had an incredible opportunity to educate the public, to educate members of Congress, to educate everyone about the difference it made in people's lives. And um, showing up on the Hill with you know young children with disabilities, with families, we really became the face of this is what tearing away the ACA would mean. Sharing our own personal uh, stories and um, really, I think that and the coalitions that were built around defending that work is what's given us the pathway to go from four years ago fighting to just save the ACA to something that's like in the proposals and build back better to take health care to just such a next level. I think the challenges that we have ahead are the unfinished business. You know, everything from the civil rights provisions in the Affordable Care Act to really making community living the, the right that it should be for everyone, the equity and, and full access, um, but we are committed to moving forward on starting to chip away at those issues. Wow. <laughs> okay, now I have to... <clears throat> um, I mean, everything that I heard from all of my colleagues resonates and just makes me so proud to be sitting here on this panel with them. Like when, Diana, you talked about the teaching health centers and that's what we worked on, you know, back in 2009. I mean, so what I would say is um, what, what I'm most proud of comes back to what I think we've heard, just how we've really impacted people's lives. You know, I worked on the ACA on a leave of absence from my residency in head and neck surgery. So in 2011, I went back um, to my training and within a month admitted a woman to the hospital who had such bad sinus polyp disease that one of her eyeballs was protruding and she was seeing double. And it was a seven hour surgery in the operating room and it was because she was uninsured until she was able to get on her parents' health insurance plan as a young adult under age 26. So I was in the OR operating on her and my, and my fellow said, yeah, you know, did you know about this law? And that now she, that's how she got health insurance? And I'm like, yeah, I know a little bit about that. But you know, I think there are so many examples like that. And I think that also dovetails into one of the challenges that again I think has been mentioned by others on this panel that healthcare is very complex and it's very personal. And so the importance of being able to educate, being able to engage, being able to have people understand where there are opportunities and galvanize so that people can work together, that complexity and just how close it gets to your heart is a challenge, but then also an opportunity for all of us. So this is the panel. I will, I will add my last thing and then we will wrap it up. Um, I, I think a couple of things. One, one of my favorite ACA things is when, I, this is a long time ago, I used to like to go into Kaiser and when I would get my birth control, TMI, but whatever, it's part of my preventative care, I would say to the pharmacist, do you know why that birth control is free? And she would say, I don't know your insurance. And I'd say, no, the Affordable Care Act. Um, and I would always say it very loud so that other women in the, the waiting room could hear me because I wanted to make sure people understood, hey, this thing you're getting that you didn't used to have before, thanks to the ACA. So um, appreciate everyone for being here today. Thank you so much to our panelists and all the work that you're, you're doing and going to continue doing and thank you so much to Beth Link and Tasha Bradley and the team at CMS for helping put this together. Um, that's a wrap. Thank you.
On this anniversary of the Affordable Care Act, I remember those struggles, the leadership of President Obama, the stewardship of Speaker Pelosi, the strong votes and support of people within the Congress and advocates like us from all across the nation. The passage of the Affordable Care Act was such an exciting moment. Um, just taking on a broken system that had been rigged by insurance companies for decades. People had a collective sigh of relief when the passage came because so many people who didn't have access to affordable health care now were able to get the care they need. Plainly put, the ACA stands for the notion that every family in our nation should be able to receive health care and not go bankrupt in the process. And looking back now on everything we've accomplished, it's hard to overstate the importance of the ACA on the health and financial security of the people of this nation. Not only did it expand coverage and provide special assistance to poor and working families, it also put in place important protections for patients, such as protecting coverage for those with pre-existing conditions, eliminating lifetime limits on coverage, and it secured coverage for young adult children in all families until they turn 26. Since the implementation of the ACA, young people have seen their uninsured rates cut in half. Many are now able to stay on their parents' insurance, while others have access to quality, affordable coverage through Medicaid expansion and the health insurance marketplace. Think about the number of parents who now have uh, the ability to ensure that their children are going to be able to access the primary care they need. What a huge sigh of relief that is for them to know that they have the security of being able to keep their children healthy. Bottom line, 12 years later, we believe that the ACA continues to provide us with a solid foundation on which we continue to build to advance health in America. The Affordable Care Act has made a difference. And if it's withstood attacks in the courts, attacks in the Congress, attacks across the community, but it has withstood the test of time and it has made a difference. You know, the ACA has given us a phenomenal foundation from which to build, and now we have to look at extending postpartum Medicaid coverage for new moms and babes for the first full year, and we also have to look at Medicaid expansion in all 50 states. We need to protect the Affordable Care Act because health care is a human right. Everyone needs health care, and access shouldn't depend on where someone lives, the color of their skin, what language they speak, whether they have a disability, or what's their gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, or their age. We take such pride in how important this law has been to our society. And we, and tens of thousands of healthcare leaders we partner with across the nation, are committed to working every day to protect the law and improve the law. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.